So our next speaker is uh, someone who has a great story, and it's really interesting to note that just a few years ago, she was sitting in the audience as a delegate here to learn, and then at some stage, she ended up being one of those people who had to present in front of some of the big names, and she got some feedback during uh, like a, you, so you think you can present slot. We saw this last night, yeah? She got some feedback from Randy Gage, which was what you might call cutting. Randy would call honest. But it upset her so much, or it affected her so much, that she went to her room and cried. And she kind of decided that she probably wasn't cut out for the speaking thing. But a few tears later, she realized actually the value of what she'd learned, the value of what she'd picked up, and she used that to then push on both as a presenter, but also as a leader in her business. She's about six weeks away from giving birth, and her and Phil are a fantastic couple, got to spend some great time with them in uh, America earlier this, uh, earlier this year, and they're yes people, they're people that say yes, they don't think about the problems, they think about how we can do this. Uh, I remember last year they were in London and they texted me saying we're in London and I didn't see it till late. I texted them at midnight to say I'm really sorry, I've seen this too late. And they said, don't worry, our flight's not for another six hours, come and meet us now. <laughs> and I went and met them at their hotel in London at midnight and we sat and had tea and cake as you do in England. And they're just great people. They also do a lot of work, a lot of which they don't talk about for orphans, underprivileged children in India, in Michigan, in Detroit. They've got education programs running. They really do give back. So please give a massive welcome to the stage to Miss Rockin' Robbins herself, Sarah Robbins. <laughs> Well, many of you know the glory of my story, but what you might not know is the struggle that led to my strength. When I found network marketing, I was a shy, young, broke kindergarten teacher. I think we had about 19 cents in our bank account. All of my friends were young and broke like me, and I was facing the loss of my job in the downturn of the economy. We live in Michigan, Metro Detroit, Motor City. That's right, but you know what happened to the automotive industry, right? So many families were moving. As a result, schools were closing, and I would go to the cafeteria every single day hearing, you're going to lose your job. That's hard to hear. So I decided to pursue extra income, and my search led me to network marketing in a roundabout way. I actually did not start my company when it was a network marketing company. I first found it when it was retail. And I started to work for them, happened to be in the right place in the right time when they were looking for ways to reach even more people and really leverage this social economy, who you know, and what they recommend is more influential now than ever before, right? So they decided to leave retail, go into network marketing. They came to my mom and I and said, do you ladies want to do this? Now, I knew nothing about network marketing, nothing, except for the fact that I said I would never, ever, ever do it. But it was my mom who said to me, Sarah, you're doing this. And being a good daughter, I listened to my mom and I said, okay. Now when I started, I was a big bundle of doubt and fear. I mean, I really didn't know, again, what I was saying yes or no to. I had no network in a business of networking. But through personal and professional growth, I was able to not only surpass my teaching income that first year, but do that consistently. And then I decided 
that I would retire. And it was perfect timing. You know, the time to look for a plan B is not when you need one. Right when I retired was when our entire program, our entire school shut down. So I started doing this full time. Five years in, by the age of 29 years old, was our company's first six-figure per month income earner. And today, we have a few hundred thousand distributors just on our team. But the beauty is, is what our business has done for so many people, the power of the profession. You know, I look at our team, and we have moms that are adopting children from the U.S. and abroad. And we know adoption's expensive. That's on our goal board, too, to expand our family rather rapidly over the next coming years. We have women who are helping to fund organizations that save victims of sex trafficking. For myself and my husband, Phil, we love children. You see, we still get to impact and influence kids, but just on a different level, on a different scale. We started our own foundation, and we're opening up orphanages and blessing children in the, US, in the U.S. and abroad. In fact, last year, right after the Mastermind event, we opened up a home for 117 boys in India, which was incredible. <laughs> and it truly does make a difference in their life. You know, they don't allow foreigners to adopt right now. Adoption is closed. And when these children get a home, it's so incredible, you guys. They're entitled to go to school, get free meals. So it really sets them up for a better life. And now this December, literally just in a matter of weeks, they will be opening up our home for little girls on the neighboring property as we're giving birth to our firstborn son, I guess God had a way of giving us daughters after all. <laughs> so it's really exciting. And by the way, my husband wanted to get on a plane and go. That's how much we love these kids. He goes, I want to go. It's the beginning of December. I'm due on Christmas. And I said, honey, you cannot be 30 hours away from me <laughs> my first time giving birth. So that's his heart. But we've got great people who will open it up there. And we just can't wait to go visit and to be a regular part of these kids' lives. So that's the glory of my story. But what's the struggle that led to my strength? You know, when I started, I was a big bundle of doubt and fear. One of my mentors says to me, you know, Sarah, I remember you sitting over your pasta at an Italian restaurant crying, wondering, how would you make $3,000 a month doing this? And here you are today. And by the way, why 3000 That's what I needed, basically, just to survive, to pay our bills. Here you are today, making six figures a month, and people say, how did she do it? I mean, when we started, we had no compensation plan. We had no training, no trainers. It was literally me and my mom. We'd get people together, and we'd train on a different topic every week. These poor people, you talk about not having a duplicable system. They'd come in and learn about a new thing, and we were training and presenting a new thing every single time. She says, though, you know, Sarah was coachable, and she was right. I've shared the story of when I approached somebody for the very first time. And if you've seen me present even over the years, you know the first time that I came up, it was a totally different story. I couldn't even breathe for three full minutes. I remember looking at the clock and I'm like, at some point I've got to start. And I was looking out at the audience and I told the story last night. I looked and I was like, there's men in the crowd. What do I do? <laughs> I had typically spoken in front of women. My same first approach, I remember the same thing, feeling like literally I was having an out-of-body experience, that I was going to die. I walk up to a cosmetics counter, and I pick up a bottle of skincare, and my hands are shaking, and my knees are knocking, and I saw stars, and I did the network marketing verbal vomit all over them, my interests, not theirs. They looked at me like a deer in headlights. 
I ran back to my car and I called my mom and I cried and I said, do I go back there? She says, don't go back there, get out of there. And I did the big, ugly cry pedal to the metal the whole way home and I wondered, how will I ever be successful in this business of networking if I'm afraid to talk to people? My president of my company, she says to me all the time, Sarah, I think you quit more than anybody else in the company. Get this, you guys, when I started, I was in my 20s. I used to call the president of our company crying and threatening to quit, okay? That's how much I didn't know, and that's how young and inexperienced I was. So what kept me going? Because obviously, I'm still here today. Initially, it was the power of my why. I had to make that $3,000 a month. And no matter what, I didn't care what it took, I was going to figure out a way to get there. Because really, as a young gal with 19 cents in my bank account, I didn't have many other options. I had a full-time job, I was taking professional development credits, I didn't have time for another job, and I certainly didn't have money to invest in a traditional business. It was my why that kept me going. But then fast forward till today. So now people say, well, gosh, it must be easy. And that couldn't be further from the truth. You know, at every place and every moment of our life and in leadership, we face challenges. And to be honest with you, some of the challenges that I have faced most recently over the past few years have been harder than when I started off. About three years ago, you know, we're in a business that's driven a lot by ego, title. Sometimes people have feelings of entitlement. We experience a lot of emotions, jealousy, insecurity. If we're being honest, we see it in our teams. I had somebody who was really close to me who called me a mentor from the stage, and this is one of my first times telling this story and one day decided that it would become a competition between the two of us. Not a decision of mine. And in fact, it came very unexpectedly to me. I basically got called to a sit-down meeting out of the blue and was told all of the things that she thought about me and everybody else thought about me too. And she was going to do everything in her power to try and tear apart my leadership to create division and to devise as many strategies and plans against me as she could. And it's hard, especially when this is somebody calling you a friend, a mentor, somebody that you trust. Little did she know during that same season of my life, our family faced a tragedy that, to be honest with you, we didn't really speak to anybody about. It was something that I hoped that nobody would ever have to go through. I was devastated. There was moments where literally I remember sitting on my bathroom floor with my computer saying, is this all worth it? And I'd want to type a response, defend myself. And I'd hear that still, small voice, stand and be still for you. I will fight for you. You be still. And I responded with integrity and love and grace. My husband hid my computer, by the way, <laughs> literally. That's a good man, literally. He's like, you will not write that email. Where's my computer my phone? You don't get them right now, okay. So responsibility is our ability to respond. I was in one of the lower seasons of my life. I remember saying, it would be easier to just go back. I had a conversation with God one day, and I sat down, and angry, just through tears, I said, God, I did not ask for this. And I felt him speak to my heart and say, this is not about you. You did not ask for this, I blessed you with this, 
so you could be a blessing to other people. That's why I've expanded your borders. That's why I've enlarged your territory. Sarah, it's not about you. Well, gosh, God, it would have been easier. It would have just been easier being a teacher. Those moments of temporary amnesia, have I forgot? Was it easier living with 19 cents in my bank account? Crying every day in the cafeteria because these teachers that were decades older than me were going to say, are you ready? Do you have another backup plan? I had to eat lunch in my car. Was it really easier? Camping in the place of complacency. Wanting to go back to what was. You know what's amazing? At the end of all that season, really, what happened? You see, pressure promotes us. If I wasn't in a place in the beginning where I faced the loss of my job, do you think I'd be where I am today? You see, I wouldn't have been open to network marketing. When the opportunity came to me, to be honest with you, I just would have flat out said, no, I don't have time for it. How did that season of pressure promote me when I faced those challenges and those difficulties in leadership? You guys, it was incredible. We were on a company-sponsored trip. And by the way, when you feel that the whole world is against you, usually it's like two people, a person and yourself. I mean, seriously. <laughs> the 100,000 other people on my team had no stinking clue what was going on. No clue. It didn't, you know, get defensive, kept all of my systems in place. I smiled, I showed up, I praised, I loved. I did not talk to one person about what was going on. I responded in love. We showed people grace. We were on a company-sponsored trip to Bora Bora, my husband and I. I did not want to be on that trip. Can you imagine you don't want to go to Bora Bora? <laughs> I sat there and I'm like, I'm not going. She's going. I am not going. And it was the most restorative moment or moments, I should say, of our life. We were sitting at a dinner table, just kind of quiet and alone. And two of the couples who were influenced, the two couples that were influenced, said, can we pull you aside and talk to you for a few minutes? We said, sure. They apologized. And they said, you know what made the biggest difference in the world? It was how you responded. You showed us love. You showed us grace. You never came back to attack. You never defended. You didn't talk bad about anybody. And we saw your character in the situation. And we were wrong, and we were wronged, and we're mad about it. But we want to say to you today, we forgive you. And by the way, would you come speak at our team retreats? Pretty powerful. Both retreat dates, I had events planned. And what do you think I do? I cleared my schedule. And we showed up, and we loved, and we served. And some of those couples are some of our best friends to date. You see, the challenge is they really changed us. Pressure is used to promote us, to propel us into greater things, into our greater destiny. At the end of that season, and I really say it was a season of obedience for me, how was I going to respond? What was I going to do? Was I going to lose my cool? I mean, at that point, I could have just retired and said, I'm not working the business anymore. I'll gladly collect a check, but I'm not working. How was I going to respond? It was incredible. You know, we actually just came from uh, Southern California. So yesterday morning, we flew here to be with you all. My husband was uh, at a pastor's conference. We left at 4 a.m. pregnant. We've had 10 flights or 8 flights, I think, over the past 10 days. It's been a lot. Um, but we were in sunny Southern California, and we were talking about our season of our life there. Some of you may know, we actually had a seasonal place, 
and we were thinking about making Southern California our permanent home. Why would you not? It is so gorgeous there. Sunny and 70 every single day, right? It's beautiful. And here I was living in Michigan with snow up to my mailbox. Right. <laughs> it's coming. You just wait. <laughs> and I remember saying to my husband, you know what? I will never live in Michigan my whole life. I'm not doing it. Not doing it. All the things we say we'll never do, right? We were back visiting family, and this was a couple years ago. This was during that season, so talking about how pressure promotes us. We we're back and we we're visiting family. We're on that little app, realtor.com. We're looking at houses just for fun. And my husband says, oh, this house is really cool. We should go check it out. I said, sure, but I will not live here, just so you know. Okay, no problem, no problem. Got it, great, okay. So we go to visit this house, and it had nothing to do with the house because we've been renovating the house over the past three years. It's a beautiful place, but we've made it our own. I walk upstairs. I'm on the balcony. I'm overlooking the balcony out to our lake, and I start to see my life flash before my eyes. I see us having kids, and this is our first, so by the way, he wasn't in existence. I see us having kids. I see my sisters having children. They don't have children yet. And I saw our families together. They all live in Michigan. And I started to cry, and I don't cry over just any old thing. And I said, this is our home. We put an offer on the house that day. And you know what happened during that season of restoration? Our family was restored closer than ever before. We've made friends over the course of the past three years that most people, it takes 30 years to form that type of friendship. In fact, when we get our friends together, there's 20 of us that are so close that you can't leave anybody out. So we have these huge get-togethers and everybody's little toddlers. The little kids always come over to our house, by the way, and they're like, where are your toys and why don't you have kids? <laughs> they're always confused. So we're building a little playroom now. But it's amazing to do life together. During that season, our best-selling book was launched. I literally wrote that in the pressure season and launched it in the pressure season of my life, literally to the point, I think it was that season where I, I couldn't even barely get myself up to do my makeup and my hair for my videos. I launched it in my pajamas. I didn't even really know what I was doing, to be honest with you. Became the number one bestseller in network marketing the day it launched, was a top seller ever since. Thank you. But the best part was at the end of that season, at the close of that season, that's where we saw our reason why in action when we were able to open up the home for those boys. What kept me going during that challenging season of life and leadership? It was those faces. You see, I was so clear on what I was doing there so connected to those sweet, smiling faces and their stories, because I knew their stories. I knew how they were found. I knew why they were orphaned. Every time I'd hear the negative Nellies, the naysayers, and just sometimes the downright nasty comments, I would remember those faces, and I would say, I'm not quitting on them. You can kick me down. But I tell you what, I'm going to get back right up and keep going. I will not quit on them. Pressure promotes us. The challenges change us if we simply do not quit. How many of you have ever been in a place where you know the promises for your life are so great? You know there's greatness inside of you. You know that you were not meant to just be here and die and live an insignificant life. Go to work, come home, go to work, come home, go to work, come home. There's more. But like me, every time 
you feel that pressure, you want to retreat, you go back to what was, or you're tempted to go back to what was. During that pressure season in my life, I really studied, to be honest with you. Um, it's about all I did. It's all I could do. And I studied the life and leadership of a man named Moses. Now, it doesn't matter your religious beliefs or affiliations, because I'm not here to preach at you. There is great lessons to be learned about leadership and this story. And I journaled some of them, and I want to share with you some of the things that I learned. Now, I don't want to miss any pieces, so I brought a few bullet points up here from my journaling. I love to write. Before we talk about Moses, I want to just back up for a moment and, and talk about a man named Joseph, because he came before Moses. A seven-year famine was responsible for the Israelite people ending up in Egypt, and at a time, a man named Joseph was in charge. Now, you talk about somebody who was loved. He was loved so much by his father loved so much by other people that he found himself in a place where people were jealous. You know when your mom said, like, they're jealous of you, Sarah, right? And you're like, yeah, mom, it's true. His brothers plotted to kill him, throw him in a pit to die. And instead of leaving him to die, they sold him into slavery now, you know what's amazing is I watched and I was reading Joseph's story. I was thinking how amazing it was in terms of how he responded. He serves in Potiphar's house. And at the time he was in Potiphar's house, his wife, Potiphar's wife, accused him of a crime he didn't commit. Basically said that he was trying to commit adultery. So they throw him into prison for a crime he didn't commit. You talk about pressure. Yet he was obedient. How did he respond in the situation? Faithfully. You know, where you want to fight, he was faithful. So much so that he was shown favor with the prison warden who brought him basically to interpret the king's dream. And as a result, the king promoted him second in charge over all the land. That's the favor that he was shown. He was promoted from the pit to the palace. The pressure promoted him. Now, initially, the people, they flourished under his leadership. But eventually, a new king came into power, and they were threatened by the Israelites' influence and the fact that this population was continuing to grow, so they ordered them as slaves to the Egyptians pressure on the people. God hears their cries. He sends Moses and Aaron to rescue them, and he sends plagues. You see, he permits problems, and the intention was basically to promote them, to propel them out of one season into another season, a greater destiny for their life. He permitted the plagues. Pressure was intended to promote them. Moses was called to lead the, the Israelite people out of Egypt and into their promised land. This was a land flowing with milk and honey. This was promised to them. It was a promise. It was their promise. Now, at times, the journey didn't look promising. At times, our journey will not look promising. They face so much pressure along the way to their promised land, but we see all the way from Exodus to Numbers that they were protected. Ultimately, they were provided for, and the intention was promotion. During that season of plagues, do you know, the Israelites were protected. The plagues did not harm their families. You hear about the story, right, of the parting of the Red Sea. When the Egyptians realized, wait a minute, we just let all of our slaves go, 
They decided to turn back around and chase them. And so here the Israelites are pinned between two of their greatest fears, the Egyptian army and a massive sea. The sea is parted. Confusion is created amongst the chariots. And literally, their enemy is wiped away before their very own eyes. They see it with their eyes. Then we see bitter water made sweet to drink, manna, provision, falling down from heaven. Yet despite all of this, the provision, the promotion, the protection, every time there was pressure or perceived problems, the Israelites find themselves grumbling and complaining with temporary amnesia, wanting to go back to what was. Yet they know the promise that's ahead. They know what they can have, but it was getting too hard. They blame man. They blame Moses. They blame their leader. Sometimes God is not so concerned about our situation as he is in how we respond to our situation. And if we are obedient and we press ahead, if we persevere in those pressure seasons of life, we can make it to our promises. They got so close, so close. They get to the border of the promised land, Kadesh Barnea, and they send in 12 spies to survey the land. Do you know 10 of the 12... There's always going to be naysayers, and their voices are always louder than everyone else's. Ten of the twelve come back, and they're like, oh my gosh, there's giants in the land. Don't go there. I'm paraphrasing, of course. (laughs) And the other two, they come back, Joshua and Caleb. Good to go. It's golden. Who do they listen to? The ten. And most of them never made it into the promised land. They believe the negative report. They start grumbling and wishing that they could go back to Egypt again and again because it was so much easier because they could eat steak there. I mean, come on, really? It was easier in Egypt? You were slaves. They wanted to give up camp in the place of complacency instead of facing their giants with faith, pressing into their promised land. They wanted to go back to bondage rather than press through the wilderness and into their promised land. They didn't have a problem. They were the problem. Camping in complacency, going back to what was, giving up because the journey was too hard. But how many of us were tempted to do that? We want to give up just because the journey's too tough. We wander in the wilderness. We wallow in our sorrow and the pain of the past. We focus on the one person who's against us versus the 100,000 people who are for us. I remember when I was facing the loss of my job. And every time somebody told me no, oh my gosh, the network marketing roller coaster. They were in, I was up. They were out, I was down. Two people on my team, one of them quit. That was half of my team. I'm done. (laughs) Every time. And I wanted to go back to what was. What was? Was it necessarily easier? But I persevered. I was clear on my purpose. You can call it your reason why. And today we've built an international business and we're opening up orphanages. And now the next step is providing education, college scholarships, for all of the children that are under or that are a part of these orphanages. Thank God I never quit. But have you ever camped in that place of complacency? Perhaps wanting to go back to what was, but you know the promises that are in store for you. You've heard so many stories this weekend of people who started from nothing, 
but the pressure propelled them into a greater destiny because of how they responded. And the choices, honestly, that they're making every single day to pursue their dream. Yet we take two steps forward and one step back. And two steps forward and one step back. You see, what should have taken the Israelites four days took them 40 years, and most of them never made it to their promise. There's danger when we camp in the place of complacency, and I love this quote. I found it by Michelle Myers randomly on Instagram, and I did a whole teaching on it. Unrecognized complacency eventually develops into decline. Unrecognized complacency eventually develops into decline. There's danger in complacency in every area of our life. You know, some of you read my story of my 65-pound weight loss. Of course, this is (laughs) pre-baby. And together, my husband and I, we lost over 100 pounds. I kept it off for over 10 years. So this is not a temporary thing. This is something that I worked hard for for a very long time. I refuse to become complacent. It's amazing the things that you hear when you're pregnant, by the way. You're never going to wear high heels. You're never going to sleep. You're never going to go on dates again. We're working all that stuff out. But the funny thing is, is I hear people say, eat whatever you want. Have so much fun. You're eating for two. And I'm sitting here going, now is the time that I should care more than ever before what I put into my body. And I'm sorry, but I don't want to take the next 10 years trying to take off that weight that I worked really hard to lose and keep off for 10 years. I refuse to become complacent. I have to make decisions every single day, even when it's convenient. You know, last night, there's this this hunger that comes upon you when you're pregnant at the end. It's like the last couple weeks, and I call it hangry. You are hungry and angry. You will eat the next person you see if you don't get food. I'm telling you what, I could have made all sorts of choices last night. My husband and I, we went in our little suitcase. We always pack our food. This is going to sound so gross, but we got our little tuna packets and our little apples. We're eating dry tuna and our apples and, you know, all the stuff that we packed. But better choices than the ones that I was just about to make. It's a choice. I can't become complacent. We can't become complacent in worship and relationships. You want to talk about losing the things and the people that are closest to you? That's when we get into the danger of complacency. Eh, you know what? This business is too important. I'll just go back and I'll build that relationship later. And you realize you're now a member of the NFL, the No Friends Left Club. No friends, no relationships. Yeah, that's fulfilling to have money and no life. But what about in our business? I could have easily become complacent. In fact, I heard those voices in my head. Sarah, what more do you need? Just retire. Go under the radar. Stop doing your calls. Stop doing your blog. Stop doing all the things you're doing. You know, just hide from all the haters and collect your paycheck. You know, I would have never quit because I have too much on the line. But that would be a form of quitting, right? When you quit, you're quitting on other people, their destiny. Because other people's destinies are tied to your obedience, your actions, your activities. So I continued on. You know, my husband and I, we were watching... um, Uh, football where they were doing the first draft picks and they were talking about all the different players and who was chosen and why and I look at these guys and I think well gosh they have a spirit of excellence they can't afford to camp in the place of complacency if they want to be somebody's first draft picked they cannot be you know eating Cheetos all year and stop working out and then the week before 
just get back in the game, in and out and in and out. They can't. They can't afford to be complacent. You can't afford to be complacent. I can't afford to be complacent. I said to my husband, if network marketing had a draft, I know that I would be one of the first ones picked, and here's why. I'm resilient, I'm consistent, I'm in activity. I am one of our company's top recruiters every single year, and every bonus they put forward, I don't care if it's the big stuff or the small stuff, I lead by example for my team and I achieve it because who am I to coach them on a fast start program if I'm not willing to get off to a fast start myself? We practice what we preach, or so we should. So my question for you is, would you be your company's first draft pick? You don't have to answer out loud. I just want you to think about that for a moment. Unrecognized complacency eventually develops into decline. So what kept us going? What kept us going was our why, our passions, our dreams. That was, that's what keeps me going today. Is we were actually at this pastor's conference. I was sitting down with some people that we work with with our angel house, and I said, how much is it going to cost to send all these boys to school, now all these girls to school? We need to know a price so then I know what I'm working toward next. And we had lunch together, and I was talking to them about how I'm motivated that way because I've actually achieved all of our company's top ranks. There's nothing else for me to achieve besides the fun little promotion and program they put out, which, again, I run for to lead by example for my team. But none of those things are serving as, you know, a big-time motivator for me if something were to come up and arise that was another challenge in my life. I've got big vision. I've got big dreams. What's next? So we were talking about what's next. You see, as your income grows in this business, so will the impact that you have on people's lives through your business, but also through the resources that it provides to you. As your income grows, so will the impact that you're able to have on so many other people's lives. It's big, and it's a lot. It's a huge thought. There's a lady on stage. I was looking for a better picture. It was the only one I could find. Who asked me back in my starting days, when I wasn't yet making 3000 a month, Sarah, what's your why? And I knew what it was. I told her I wanted to start a foundation for women and children that would be fully funded by my network marketing earnings. And she said to me, how much is it going to cost? And I told her, millions. And she said, how does that feel? And I said, I'm totally overwhelmed. You see, at times, instead of working as a motivator, it would demotivate me because it just seems so far away. When somebody said no or somebody quit, it was tempting to just want to give up. And she gave me the best advice. She said, I want you to break down your reason why and work in goals towards your why. You know, set some goals now. Whether you put aside a portion of your check every single month, do something nice for kids in need. And that's what we did. Sent some kids to fine arts camp, paid some medical bills, built a handicap ramp. And again, as our in income grew, so did the impact that we were able to have on other people's life. But now, instead of being fueled by my disappointments and my doubts, now I was being driven by my dream. My husband and I, we still do this today. We set our giving goals, different causes and organizations we give to. We get paid on the 15th of every month. Anybody else, is that a holiday for you in your home? Woohoo for the 15th. <laughs> so on the 15th of every month, we sit down together and we call it our big give day. And we look at all the projects we're passionate about, different ministries, opportunities, etc., places that we want to give of our time and resources, and we meet together, and we set our, our goals. But we also talk about the goals, the things that we're going to be pursuing and praying for in our life. 
We talk a little bit about our goals for our faith, our family, our friendships, fitness and health, finances and giving. And then, of course, goals that are related to our business and ministry as well. So we're always aligned on where we're going. And that's what's part of, you know, what keeps us from becoming complacent as a team. Because we believe that our dream really is one. I want to encourage you that if you have this amazing dream, and maybe it's a little overwhelming to you, that you start to look at just every single month, something that you can do to contribute to that cause that sets your heart on fire with passion and motivation to get up and to hear one more no, to get one more phone call. Oh, I don't know if this is for me. I think I'm going to quit. What's going to keep you going? What's going to fuel you? What's going to feed you? What is your why? I want to talk to you a little bit about the importance of this, and I heard um, my friend Orion talking about this. Sometimes I think this is a step that we skip over, and it is significant, but we can make it even more significant than what it is. The importance of this for new people, for leaders, and for people that we mentor. If you're new to the business, if nobody's told you, you are going to face more rejection over the coming years than you probably may have in your life so far. You're going to hear no every day. You need to know why you're doing this business. If time and money were no object, how would your life look? For me, I was never passionate about network marketing before I did it. Now I'm head over heels in love with our profession. Don't get me wrong. But it wasn't about network marketing. It honestly wasn't even about my product. I love my product. But it wasn't about that. It was about having a vehicle to passionately pursue my dreams. You need to know why you're doing this. And to say, I just want to earn more money, that is not enough. Because you can earn more money taking on another J-O-B. It's not enough. If time and money were no object, how would your life look? It's not enough to say, well, I want to save my husband or help my husband. Your husband needs to help himself. It's not enough because when it's too hard, I'm sorry, honey, you're on your own. I'm being funny when I say that, of course. For leaders, some of you set a goal a very long time ago. And perhaps it's time to revisit that goal. Maybe you're at the place like me where you're saying there's nothing else really in my company to run for or that I'm motivated by or passionate about. And you know what? To be honest, Sarah, if you were to ask, I don't know if I'd be my company's first draft pick anymore. Like I knew I was about five years ago, but maybe not so much today. Why in the world are you doing this? Because you have a greater impact to make on the world, if you had more time, more resources, what would you do with them? If you had more people to impact and to influence, what would that mean to the world? Remember that conviction I had of, I didn't ask for this? It's not about you anyways. It's about the people that are supposed to be blessed by your influence. Other people's blessings are tied to your obedience. Obedience is getting back into activity, finding that same place of passion from when you started. If you had more, what would your life look like? More people to impact, more people to influence. And what about people when they start off and they hear no? As a top recruiter in my company, I hear this a lot because I work with a lot of people. Oh, man, so-and-so told me, no, I just don't think this is for me. Thank goodness I talked to them about the reason why because I can go back and say, you're not quitting on those kids. You told me that a college scholarship is important to you, and I won't allow you to quit on your kids. Let's get back into activity. 
Let's look at what you're saying, who you're reaching out to. Let's get back into action, girlfriend. And we do. We're going to take some time today before we leave because we just got all of this excitement and motivation and what do we do? We go back home. And there's nobody maybe cheering us on anymore or inspiring us or sharing their story. Motivation needs to be with, internal. It needs to come from within. We're going to take just literally three minutes, and I'm going to ask, unless you've got an airplane, to not leave during this time. I know some of you may need to use the bathroom, but I'm pregnant, and I cannot take a break, so neither can you. <laughs> Stay put, okay? All the guys are like, I don't quite understand. I promise. It's significant. Okay, so... I want everybody to stay where they are. For three minutes, that's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking. Is that we're going to take a moment to allow ourselves to revisit our dream. Some of you haven't dreamed in a very, you haven't dreamt in a very long time. Some of you, I'm just going to be giving permission to dream for about three minutes. I want you to write down your why. If time and money were no object, how would your life look? Where would you live? What would you drive? Where would, you go to, where would your kids go to school? Would you have any debt? What would you do with your money, your time, your impact, your influence? I want you to write it down almost like it's a movie. Speaking in present tense, no wimpy words like I wish or I hope or someday but I am, I will, I see, this is our future. You map out all the things that are important to you. We're going to play some soft music. I'm going to give you about three minutes to do this. If you've already written your why, we can start doing this now. Write down some goals. I call them our goals, they all start with the letter F, for your faith, your family, your friendship, fitness and health, finances and giving, your business, ministry, marketplace ministry, whatever is important to you. I'm going to give you guys the time now. Craft a compelling vision for your future. The more specific it's going to be, the more powerful it will be. It'll cause you to face your fears, persevere. This is your compelling vision for your life. I believe we all know what to do. It's the choices that we choose to make what we choose to say yes to. I had a group of people doing this last week in Texas, and I saw tears rolling down people's eyes, and it was very clear that there were people who hadn't dreamt for a very long time. We're tired, we're busy, we're complacent. When people give up on us, you can't give up on you. Because there are people on the other side of your obedience. Be clear about what you're doing. Give you about another minute. And this will just be something you start. We're all going to have ups and downs, challenges and achievements, disappointments and success. But when we're clear about our purpose, our why... It helps us to be driven by those dreams rather than being fueled by disappointments. I want to encourage you too, when you go home, share it with your spouse, significant other, 
your sponsor, your accountability partner, if you don't have somebody to be accountable to in business, find anybody. It does not have to be your sponsor. It doesn't have to be your upline. In fact, I recommend it's not. It's a different relationship, a different way to communicate. I want you to tell them what your dream is and ask them to partner with you and encourage you and motivate you. But you be motivated by it too. We're hanging up our dreams in our office. Which, by the way, it was so cool. We pulled out this little piece of paper. We've been married 11 years. And we pulled out this little piece of paper from our very first house. And it was amazing because we saw every single one of our dreams come true. We've always been unified in our vision, my husband and I. And we always had a commitment to our vision and a spirit of excellence. I want you to be that committed to your life and to your dream, to your family, to your team. I'm going to let you kind of continue on with that. If you want to keep writing, it's fine with me. If you want to take it home and finish it, please commit to finishing it. Because today I declare that you are finishers and you are more than conquerors and you have everything that it takes to succeed. And if this shy young kindergarten teacher can do it, why the heck can't you do it? You can. Your life is a result of the activities and the choices that you make. That was me then. Over 65 pounds of weight loss. I cried. I dug for that picture, by the way. I did not want to share it. I was like, dear Lord. I had to dig to even find a picture of me before because I never liked taking pictures. One day I just got up and I was like, with so many good things going on in my life, I don't have time for garbage in my mind. The garbage in my mind was, oh, you're overweight. Oh, you're going to go on stage. You can't wear that. Look at you. I no, had, no longer had time for these lo looming negative thoughts in my mind. I decided that I was going to take responsibility to get into activity every single day, counting my calories, drinking my water, going to the gym. No magic potion or pill, sorry to anybody in a weight loss company, but I worked really hard every single day for 10 years of my life, and I kept it off. Thank you. It was hard. But I love when people say, what's your secret? There is no secret. It was hard work. People say the same thing. Well, you've been in network marketing for, you know, eight years. You know, what is your secret? How have you done what you've done? There's no secret. I've worked my butt off every single day for eight years and counting, and I'm never going to be done recruiting and prospecting. For weight loss, I'm never going to be done eating right, drinking water, and exercise. I'm just never going to be done. I can't afford to be complacent. Activity and accountability is going to be the key to your success as well. And then you break it into goals. And you watch your life and your why transform before your very eyes. I wasn't able to show this clip last year because... We were actually leaving the Mastermind event, going to India, about 30 hours of travel and several planes and trains to get to where we were, to open up these homes for these little boys who, by the way, the area in which they live, they would have otherwise been gang members, so they were saved from being on the streets. I want you to watch a clip and see the power of a yes decision to get out of complacency into activity, other people's lives being transformed by our obedience. Watch this video. They loved that all the flowers got stuck in my hair.
make me cry every single time. Thank you. And now as we give birth to our firstborn son, we'll welcome all of these girls to their brand new life. You guys never quit on your team, your future team, your family, the power of your dream. There is nothing like seeing your reason why in action. God bless you.